That was a short break, right, Chris? <laughs> Just enough to get something to eat real quick. Hello, hello, hello. Yeah, I was just saying it was a short break between the last class and this class. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but we can get this done. It's it's not going to take the whole two hours, but we're going to get into some of the detail stuff. Yeah, I have to catch up on the other on last week's homework, too. Oh, yeah. Well, that one is easy. It's It's acquisition, so. Okay, cool. All right. So I think it's such a small class. I'll just go ahead and get started. And then if we finish early, then I'll let you guys go early. But um, so today we're going to do chapter four. And then we'll, so we'll talk about hard drive because that's part of the data acquisition. It's important to tie in the technical where everything is. Um, you're going to do a lab this week for Windows um, analysis where you actually take a look at the address and use some of the tools. And then um, I will post the homework, excuse me, assignment. So I'll take care of that. So by next session, you should be able to see that. Okay. All right. So I'll go ahead and go into screen share. If you have any question, let me know. Okay, so you can download the unit four note. Sorry, I couldn't turn it on earlier. I, I had done something in between the break and then there's the notes. And then if you go to the next tab or the next uh, link, you would have the assignment in the module. Okay, so let's talk, let's go to the notes. So last week we talked about validating the tools, um, going through the data acquisition process or the evidence acquisition process, uh, looking at different tools. I touch a little bit on the resources for mobile data acquisition. Uh, this week we're gonna look at, you know, the storage area and how different offering system would utilize um, file system differently and where the files are located. Mainly the authors address windows um, in this particular chapter. So we will talk about the drive itself and you know physically how it is and then logically where things are located. Okay, so importantly, we have to understand the technical aspect of the computer system and the operating system because this is where we're going to be able to drill down and look at where the files are at. And um, you have to understand the boot process and how the systems are and what kind of file system you're using so that way you can eliminate mistakes. Because if you start looking everywhere, you might create mistakes as when you open up things that might change or modify some of the state of that file. So we have to understand how it works, what it is, in order to avoid mistakes. So in the first question, you can find the answer on page one. Uh, let me open up my instructor notes. Okay. So, um, so your technical knowledge and operating system file system boot process will minimize investigation mistakes. And mistakes that would occur when you alter evidence, which impacts investigation, especially in the area of integrity. So if we don't have adequate evidence, we cannot have a case. And it also show your credibility as an investigator. So knowing the operating system, the file system, the boot process will remove some of the mistakes or eliminate some of the mistakes, and that's important. So in CIS 25, we touch on you know, operating system, the boot process, but we're gonna get 
in depth with it, looking at how the forensic investigator will look at the boot process and the files, because, you know, evidence could be sitting in the boot process or it could be sitting in different area of your disk. So let's go into the boot process. So some of the stuff, uh, some of the definition you probably heard before and it would be review, but some of the later things we'll talk about that will be new. So we have to understand the process so that way we can implement control and we want to have a sound environment so that way we can eliminate our mistakes. In the boot process, you would have a power on self test and this is post. This is when you hear the beep of your computer. Your system, your processor will use the ROM, which stores your basic input output information for all your components that are connected to the motherboard. And it's gonna try to identify the signal for those components, what they are. So it's gonna read the, the, the identified information that's in BIOS for all the components. And if everything's okay, you're gonna get a short beep. Now on the newer system, we don't use BIOS, we use UEFI and we eliminate some of the posts. So on the older system, you see that it does the post test, it checks the BIOS to make sure everything is in place before it actually starts the boot process. So all of this is the initial part of the boot process. Now, if it cannot access your hard disk or your storage media to really boot the operating system, this is when it would notify the user or when it would make the noise, it would make the beat, okay? So the processor job is to look at what devices are connected so that way it can actually assign tasks to specific device or take requests from specific device. So in the boot process, it actually work with, it works with the hard drive, and then identify the files on that hard drive to be able to execute the task so that way it will load the OS. So we talk about the boot, the, the post in the boot. And on the newer version, in, in place of BIOS, we know that it uses the UEFI, which is more advanced. Number one, it allows you to have a secure boot, which requires authentication with the operating system in order to be able to access the rest of the booting device. Second, it, it's faster and it's allowing larger media to be able to be used as um, boot or in the boot process, especially working with additional drivers. And then it also supports the newer, for the Windows environment, it supports the newer partition table instead of the MBR. So for the next question in our assignment, what occurs during the power on self test? It tests essential motherboard functions, what device, what components and the devices are connected. Essentially, we want to take a look at all the components, right? Your display monitor, which allows you to see the, uh, you know, the interface for the operating system, your hard drive or your storage media, it could be your solid state that contains your file system, and then the keyboard and the mouse which allows you to control, right, for the input and the output. And, you know, so all the components, even the, the video adapter, so that way it would translate, right, the information or the data into what you would see as image. So the power on soft test is very important. It verifies that the components are connected and working. And now, if before we talk about change of the boot, do you have any questions as far as post? Okay. So in UEFI, we know that it's faster. It's more secure as far as the, the boot process, but that can create the problem for us in the forensic side and, and the author touches on that later. Okay. Now, um, if you're attempting to boot alternate booting device, which is what we normally would use, like a USB, right, you have to authenticate 
you have to be able to authenticate in order to tell which device to boot and change the priority of the boot. Most of the time we don't boot to the suspect system or the investigated system, we would boot to a USB in which we would have the ISO or you know a, a type of, of machine that would be able to capture the image from the suspected system. Okay, we don't boot to that system because it will change the state. So in BIOS, um, if we're looking at master boot record, your MBR, master boot record is older for Windows, and it would locate the first section of the disk, which is sector zero. And this will hold the active partitions or the boot loader section of that drive, okay? So MBR needs to determine where is the boot sector and that boot sector would contain boot information for that operating system, which is could be Windows 7, Windows 10, or other, or other version of Windows. This is called the boot loader, and the boot loader is a, a, a code that's going to allow you to load the operating system. So it's used for a specific operating system. Okay. Now on the on the Linux process is the same way. It's going to revert to the active partition, and in the active partition, you saw that in lab two, we would be able to identify, you know, the OS and the boot and all of that. Okay. So in the MBR, the primary needs to be active in order to boot. Okay. Another type of table is the GPT or GUID. So GPT allows us to expand the scale of the storage and have more partitions created for the operating systems. So what happened is if you're working with an older computer, you would likely, especially older Windows system, you would likely see the MBR or traditionally, we have a choice. We can partition it with the MBR or GPT, right? Traditionally, you see that people would choose to have an MBR. And with that, the limit is that you only have four partition for the MBR. So MBR, its job is to find the bootloader, which is the code that it can launch the operating system. And so that needs, and, the, and then after it finds that code, it's gonna pass it over to the OS which is at the software level now, right? And then, so that way it will go through the booting process of the OS, where it will load all the drivers, and then it will be able to get you to the authentication screen. So UEFI, if it's working with GPT, it's gonna point to GPT, and that would uh, contain a list of the partitions for that system and then from there it's going to need to identify which partition is going to contain the boot information okay so just like bios it needs to identify how many partitions on that drive and then from there on because gpt has higher than four it can go up to 128 max it would find the section of that drive or the partition that will have the bootloader. Okay, so why is this important for us? It's because sometimes, right, we have to use external media to be able to really access or pull the image, create the image from that system so we can evaluate. And so we have to know what is being used in the boot, and possibly also if we're investigating a system that launched something at boot, we have to really know what that process is. So for number three, we will likely have to access BIOS right on the older system to really change how the system would boot. So how do you change the boot setting in Windows system? If you're using BIOS, you simply press a function key into setup, right, when it first power on. 
that it would tell you what function key that is. Then you would access the BIOS menu and then you would be able to modify the boot priority and that's usually in the advanced option depending on the version of BIOS. So you can change the priority in the boot. So if I wanted to boot to USB, that will be the first priority instead of the hard drive. We don't want it to go to the hard drive because we want to boot to, to our USB, our drive, to be able to launch our, could be, you know, live system or virtual machine, and then, or ISO and or image, and then be able to capture the image, okay? So the steps are summarized there, but you get the point, right? Access BIOS menu, select the appropriate menu to change your boot priority. And from that, it will give you a list of what's recognized. So if you see now in some older cases, they would use CD or DVD, then you would boot to CD or do DVD. We want to go to the drive that contains. We want to boot to the drive so that way we can collect the artifacts instead of using the system itself. Okay, any question? So the beginning of the chapter, it, it really goes in depth with how to use the boot process for the forensic uh, acquisition step, okay? Now, if you need to use bootable CD, DVD, of course, we have to change the boot priority, but we have to also put the media into the drive, right? And now most computers don't come with CD or DVD uh, drive, so what we have to do is we have to use a USB device that's able to read CD or DVD. So you have to enable the boot priority for USB. Okay. Um, so it touches a little bit on Linux standard operating system. We can use the Linux Live as, you know, and put it on USB or CD or DVD, right? Like the olden days where we would run the Linux live system, right? And we can boot to that. So you gotta make sure you point to that, that boot uh, drive. You can also use Paladin, which is one of the tool we talked about last week. And Paladin allows you to create a bootable USB for the purpose of gathering evidence. Something that the authors mentioned throughout the textbook is WinFE, which is window forensic environment. And WinFE has been around for a long time. So there's a link to the information that you need for WinFE. So this allows you to get access to Windows bootable environment, and then you can select the appropriate tools. So it comes with some equipped tools. Um, for this particular purpose. So this was used back then, and I think some investigators still often use it now. Okay. Or you can also use other tools like X-Way or FTK Imager. Those um, toolkits actually give you some of the features so you can create bootable uh, drive and then be able to acquire from there through their software. Okay, and those are, com you know, the FTK is the commercial software, so, okay. So in any tool, what you have to do is you have to be able to get to the boot drive. And then on your boot drive, you would have an image, like an ISO. So that way you can either, you know, launch a Linux or some type of operating system so you can start gathering evidence. And within that, that image you would have the appropriate tools to be able to acquire or create right a, a, a backup image of that system okay which secure boot for uefi because it has to trust the software you have to enable the trust or you have to disable the secure boot 
otherwise it doesn't trust because there's no trust established yet for for your your ISO on your USB. So I just create an ISO. Let's say that I'm running Kali Linux, right? And on my USB drive, and I plug it in, I would go to UEFI. I have to disable secure boot so that way I can set my USB to be the boot priority. Okay. Now to use UEFI not from the system itself, you can actually press the function key depending on the manufacturer that will also bring you into the UEFI. Okay. So it, they mentioned that you can use other setup utility to be able to, you know, go through and acquire the or set up the, the boot option. Okay. So when you I, I'm considering to do this as part of our project as well. And I will send you your evidence bag along with you know your USB that you need. So you will you can create a forensic bootable device. And I, I will write the procedure for this as well. So you just need something that would be eight gig or higher. Ideally, if we're running, you know, a larger image, you want to some image will go over 12 gig. So something that we can afford now is 16 or higher, right? So you can acquire a USB and it all depends on how fast you want it to be. You can use 2.0, it's a little slower than 3.1. Then you, what you need on that USB is an ISO, the operating system, the operating system image, okay? So if you want Windows and it will be Windows ISO, you want, um, do you want Linux and it will be Linux ISO? And a lot of the times you would find Linux live CD. So you just have to be able to, to set that up. And some of you have learned how to do Ubuntu live through my security class, CIS 27. So if you have that, right, you already have one step done. Then what you can do is you can install the tools onto Ubuntu. Okay. And Ubuntu, since it's Linux, you can you know, do a lot of that through the terminal. Now, to create your, your image or your bootable drive, you can use something like Rufus, okay? So there are version of Rufus for Windows and Mac OS, so I put the link there for you. So if you're using Mac OS to create a bootable drive, you can go to the site and then make sure that you read the instructions or review the instructions before you attempt it, okay? You can also use UNet Bootin, and this is the newer uh, type of tool, so that will work cross-platform, so you can use it on Linux, Windows, and Mac OS, okay? So that was added. I include that. Any questions as far as the tools to create a bootable USB so we can use and set up the computer. Okay, so let's answer the next part. Is this what kind of information does MBR contain? Um, MBR is master boot record. Okay, and I'll get to that section soon. And what it does is it, it has a list of all the divided section on the disk called partitions and the file system for the operating system, the bootloader code, we saw some of that earlier for the installed operating system. So if we're looking at, this is for Windows, it would be, right, it could be FAT uh, file system, it could be, you know, 500 gig as the, the, the section that's divided for that drive, and then it contains the boot loader code. So MBR is essential in loading the operating system because first it has to find where it is on the drive and all the content of it. Now the difference between MBR and GPT is that GPT contains up to 128 partitions and it can be used with UEFI. It's used for more modern operating system 
right? Like your Windows 10. And you can current with the file system NTFS with Windows 10, but you can also use EXFAT, which is 64-bit FAT. So as you can see, the knowledge for the basic, right, uh, technical knowledge like from CS25 and also CS27 is essential in forensic because you have to really get into the nitty gritty pieces of information. What is a drive? What type of partitions, et cetera? Okay. So what do we really mean by, you know, how many partitions? And I showed this for my CS25 class. So you can have, um, you can go into your computer management console in your Windows environment. You can really see your disk drive. So disk management. So here's my system. Right, as you know that Windows uses, it, it, it actually used the label C as the root drive, but every operating system would have a root drive which contained root directory. And with that, we would have C, and here we see that I use NTFS, okay? So, for, this is an active primary partition because it's used for boot. So in this section, what that is, is that it would be the primary section of the drive and it has the OS, therefore it's active. Okay. And you can create, you know, different sections of the drive to store like recovery partitions, um, you know, and then there's a reserve section, which we'll talk about down the line, that is going to be for the system information and how it's going to be able to point to. So it has to have a space for that list to be identifying other spaces or other section on the disk. Okay. Okay. And and then as you can see, my USB drive, it is shown as a FAT32 file system. And it's approximately under 16 gig, even though it's 16 gig, but we can, it's usable about 14.65. And it's also is, the system sees it as a separate entity. So here, what we would note is that your GPT can have 128 different sections in the drive or partitions where MBR can only have four. And that's because the design back then, it's really for the limitation of the disk. The older hard drive can only store up to a certain size and it can only be sectioned up to so many. So they have to write software to really accommodate that. Now we have more capability if with the larger drive, capacity is much bigger. And then also we're able to, you know, section up the drive for different purposes. So they change, they improve the operating system to accommodate larger drive and more partitions. So GPT is more for more the modern system. And then, um, so we can use USB or optical disc, optical media to for our system image, okay? Especially when the drive is not removable from the system. So let's say that you go and you acquire the evidence, but you cannot take that drive from that system and you need to evaluate the evidence on the drive. So what you have to do is you have to create a bootable USB or bootable CD DVD so you can take the image of that system from that drive and then to be able to evaluate. And in general, we would do that anyway, okay? Now remember that your tool must be tested. So what you have to do is you gotta make sure that you validate. That means that before we use the tool, we have to test it multiple times to make sure that that's, you know, the result is the same and nothing is gonna change our tool, okay? So that, will, that way it will be consistent for gathering evidence. We talked about that last week. 
Okay, so that leads us to the next part. Before using the bootable media, what should a forensic investigator do? So once you create your bootable USB or your live CD or your CD or your DVD bootable media, you need to test the bootable media in a lab environment. So on a secure system, that's not gonna be impacted by you know, other factors and to make sure that there's no change was made. And we wanna be testing it multiple times so that way it's consistent, right? And if you're using software tool to test it, then you know, all you have to do is to check and make sure that that, that particular US, you, the content in that USB or CD or DVD stays the same throughout. Okay, any question? No question. Okay. So let's also get into the terminology and how the drive is laid out because you will also work with the physical drive and the logical drive, okay? So when we refer to the logical device, that's really about volume and how we divide that up into, because physically it's one drive, but we can section it, have little partitions for that drive inside. So that's a more of a logical division. Now the, the drive letter, it's not really assigned to the physical drive, it's really to the logical drive, right? Because we physically have one drive, but we can have many drive letters for that one drive. Now, the picture that's, that's shown that I took also shows the drive that's open. And the only way that we would be able to read data from the platter if once it's open is to use a specific uh, device that would read the platter individually. You don't do this if you're just using your computer to read it as a storage. Uh, once you open it, right, if you cannot plug it in, put it back and use USB adapter to connect it anymore, no. Okay, so they have specific device and that could be very expensive um, as hardware for the lab environment to read the magnetic disk individual platter. So here, what we, we, we are gonna show here is that you have platters and in the more close to a modern drive, you would have multiple platters. It also depends on the capacity. So you have platter that spins and on the platter you have tracks or circles. And on each track you have sectors, which is section of that circle. Now, this is the read right head. It doesn't touch the platter, but it does move it back and forth to be able to read the data, okay? You have the actuator, which is the mechanical component that's gonna move the read right head back and forth. So now we learned that when the head touches the, the actual platter in CS25 that you would have head crash, you don't it doesn't ever touch, right? Um, so what we would do is we would use magnetic to be able to get pieces of data in from different sectors. So here, what you see is inside of an HDD, a hard disk drive. Now we don't use HDD as much as we did before. So we often go to solid state because performance is better, and the technology is different. Inside, it won't be like this. It will be different, okay? So this is, it shows you what a platter would look like, a read-write head, and then I open up a few of the old disks. 
So on the drive geometry, if you're looking at like a 2D version of this, you would have a track, which is the circular path of the surface and the platter, right? And you might have drives that have two platters, you have more than two platters, depends, okay? So the circular are the tracks and then pieces of it is the sector. The older drive, each sector is 512 bytes. On the newer drive, each sector can go up to 4096 bytes. So it's much larger, therefore we have larger capacity. We're able to fit more into each section, each piece, okay? So all, this is also in the textbook, so you can see. All right, any question? This is important, and the smallest unit on the drive is a sector, okay? So in any case, right? So for example, if, you, if you're writing a file that's one gigabyte, let's say like a video file, it's very large. What happens is it's gonna spread across and it can go from, you know, because it's dynamically writing, so it's gonna drop it into this sector, that sector, you know, in different areas of the disk. It's so which makes it become fragmented. And the author talks about that down the line, so you do see that with the notes. And that's important to visualize because when you forensically investigate when you're looking at you know the the software tool that we look at how the the data is spread across different section or addresses in that storage right and represented with hexadecimal then we have to know that oh this is a very large file it's spread across this part this part and this part so In the next one, for number eight, we answered that previously, the type of software tool. And these are just a few that we mentioned, but you can probably find other tools as well. Paladin, Rufus, Unit Bootin. In the drive geometry for number nine, um, the older disks have cylinder, which consists of multiple platters because they have to fit you know, only so many sector per platter, and we have to have multiple platters, okay? On the newer disk, you often see one platter because we're able to fit more data into one sector so we can have so many sector on that disk. And when you look at the drive, the drive information, uh, I don't have any of the hardware ones, or maybe I put it somewhere, but, um, it actually shows you on the sticker or another way that you can find like sector size and things like that is through the setup information or the boot information. When it boots it, the boot setup, it actually tells you, okay? And we'll touch on that. So the cylinder would consist of multiple platters. The platter would consist of multiple tracks, which are the circles on that platter and then each track has many sectors and it could vary in range. Also, if you're looking at how old is the disk to how new is the disk, right? So if I have 512, 512 megabyte, 512 byte per sector, sorry, I have this wrong. 512 bytes per sector, then it's, there. I would have more sectors on that platter and I would require multiple platters. Compared to more modern disk, you would have larger bytes per sector. So your number of sector can change to depending on the capacity and also when it was produced. Okay, any question as far as drive geometry? Okay. So that's for HDD.
Now, in the older drive, you also see like the CHS value, which is cylinder head and sector. So it will give you the number. This is the amount of cylinder. This is the amount of head. This is the amount of sector. And head just refers to read write head. So each platter would have two heads. So if you have one platter, you might have two heads. If you have three platters, you might have six heads. So it would identify that. And you know, the if you look at the, the drive sticker, it actually has a chart for most part. Most manufacturer did that. Um, and then it also identify your L LBA, your logical block addressing. But we would be able to identify CHS, right, to be able to really see where, how our file's gonna spread out. Okay. So that's the physical disk. For the drive interface, the old drive is the SCSI. And back in the day, they would use SCSI drive, so small computer system interface. SCSI, we call that SCSI. This is, on the olden days, they used SCSI for servers, for, you know, like, would be like, like some of the things that for banking or could be anything that would be heavy use um, because SCSI is highly reliable back then. And you can daisy chain the drives together. So you can have up to 16 chain with one terminated at the end. Technically it's 17 with one termination. Um, but some of them with the older standard, there were only seven. So what, what do I mean by daisy chain, all right? And uh, that means that I can connect one drive to two other drives and then two other drives to two other drives. So we can daisy chain out. It's kind of like how you set up your Christmas lights using extension cords so you can extend it out to multiple light strands. Okay. So SCSI was common. You don't see SCSI as much anymore. And it uses specific SCSI cable. And on the last device, you have to say that that's, that's the end uh, because you know all the other ones you have it turn on so it circulates from one to, or it passes from one to the next, to the next, to the next. Um, and then the flat ribbon drive, which is very old right, in the late 90s and the early 2000s, you would see those. So if you come across older computer, you would see the flat ribbon cable that would be the cable that connects for IDE and EIDE. Also HDD drive. So the newer technology we are using is your SATA, so your serial ATA, and currently we're using SATA 3. It's faster, right? Throughput is about six gigabit per second for, you know, data transfer rate, that's what I meant. Um, and then for the serial attached SCSI, on the newer SCSI, you would see that it would be SAS or serial attached SCSI. I don't see that as often. Um, rarely do I see a server machine now that has serial attached SCSI, but only because our, our solid state is, flash technology is very affordable. We don't use some of the old interface. And then outside of the HDD, we go into the solid state. And so here, you know, so it uses flash technology. There's no moving parts. So definitely faster, better, more reliable, doesn't break as quick. Um, so you would have chips that are built into the, onto the actual, so sometimes they come as a card, right? You would see the chips, but sometimes you would get that something that's enclosed. So I just got one for the PC that I'm building for my CS24A. I will soon put the YouTube video up for that. Um, so you would see that there are chips that's built onto the card and that would plug it onto the slot or the bus of the motherboard. 
And then even with your USB, that's also a chip, right? It uses flash technology. It's lighter. Data access speed is tremendously faster. You would reduce less power. There's less power consumption in it. And there's no moving part, so it doesn't break. So, and the only downside that we see from the forensic is that the firmware, right, that's going to launch so that way it would see that, oh, this is the drive, this is what it's supposed to do, right? It, it's going to want to read, write, because that's its job. Also, some of the functionality that comes with you need to be aware of because that can change how our files that we're trying to get for our evidence, it can change those files. So first thing is we're leveling. That means that it's going to spread across multiple chips as at the same rate when it writes. So when, you, when you're saving your file, what it's going to do is going to spread from one chip to the next and so forth. So that way it can wear, it, wear the chip evenly at the same rate, okay? So what does that mean for forensic? We have to understand that when in the solid state, you have to look in different areas, okay, of, of the actual chip because it's a chipset, right? Uh, with the trim, when the user, we talked about this last time, but when the user deletes the file, what that does is, that it takes that space and it puts it back into the available space. So technically it's still there, but what happened is it changes the space allocation when we evaluate it. So let's say that you are investigating a suspect and, and this person delete, let's say a thousand files on the solid state. What that will do is the space that used to be occupied by those files gets put back into the unallocated space. So now it is in, it's somewhere else, okay? So, but we'll get into the deleted files for a certain file system so that way you can, you can take a look. And then garbage collection, it basically scans the, the, the card or the module to identify the pages within the data blocks that have been deleted. So that way, you know, like where you put things into recycle bin and, or delete things permanently, right? Trim, when you delete things permanently, it trims, it puts it back. And then garbage collection. So when you do clean this, right, it asks you, oh, do you want to take stuff from recycle bin? And, and you know put it back into the drive available space. If you click yes on that, right, that's a garbage collection process is happening in the back there. So on the, at, on the solid state, it, it moves that from one, the data blocks. Once it wipes it, it reuses that block. So that block is on a certain chip, so it reuses that for, for new files, okay? Now, it can only delete the data in the blocks, okay? That's what it states. So when it moves it, it can only delete the data in that block. No way to stop it from functioning, so we just be, have to be aware of it, so that way we can start looking for pieces of information there, okay? Which is tricky, and which makes this job highly demanding because there are other areas that, there's so many different areas that we have to look without making mistakes. Okay, any question as far as solid state, drive geometry, any of that? Okay, no question. So here it talks about the primary. So as I showed you earlier, primary could host the operating system that would be the section in the drive that would have the operating system that would boot, that will be active. Um, it can also contain other form of data. So MBR, in, where you can find the MBR is on sector zero. So in Linux, you would see that it would say SDA zero, right? So that will be your sector zero. 
Now, when it becomes one, that's the next one, right? So we would start with the zero as the first. And um, it will no longer, it won't be as big. So you don't have it that big. It will be very small. So it would take up up to one sector at 512 bytes. That's how it's designed. So your MBR, your record, which is think of it like a list of what the other drive would be or what the drives would be on that physical drive, it will be very small and it's in the sector zero. Okay, so this is what it would look like on the software level. So when we look at it using a software, okay. So the offsets right here is just how it would allocate sections of space within that to really store something. And a lot of the times when you look at this, right, we revert back to hexadecimal value to really say, oh, well, what does that mean in that section or in that space of that section? Okay. So they're using they're using a, a software tool to look at that section of the drive. So this really depicts what the MBR on the physical hard disk would be. Okay. And it gives you the the information here. So how many bytes that would be? The final two bytes is the signature of the MBR what that would look like. It identifies the ending of the MBR. Okay, so here are the four bytes. Okay, so how do I know it's four bytes? So if you ever learn about hexadecimal, it's 16 bits, right? So all of these values combined, that would give me the four bytes. So there is one byte, two, three, four. So the four bytes are the disk signature that identify the offering system of that disk. Okay. So think of like every offering system would have its signature and it would take up that much space. Okay. Then the first 440 is going to be the boot code. And then the last part is actually the MBR for that sector, which is two bytes, which is very small. Okay, any question? And the book does a good job with showing you how that would logically look like. So at the abstract level, this is what it looks like, right? All of this is that we're trying to show the human of what that this would contain. Okay, so here is a closer look at how how the four partition table would look like. So you have each row is one. Okay. And as you can see, if it's identifying as zero, zero, that's that will be the non active. Okay. Okay, because zero holds nothing. And then if you have the, the, the hex, if it's 80, 80, then it would uh, identify that as an active partition. Any question? Okay, no question. Sorry about my dog. They're barking at the cat or something outside. Delivery man. Okay, so no question. So here, what is an active partition in an MBR? It's the primary partition to boot the system. And within that, we talked about how it would have, you know, the boot information or the boot code for that OS. And when you evaluate it closer from the forensic standpoint, 
it would have the value to indicate the signature for that operating system. Okay. Um, and then VBR. So every partition has a volume boot record, which is also at sector zero, that first section. Uh, the system would use this to boot the operating system volume. So it is really tied to the type of operating system and how it's formatted. Okay, so that would tell the volume, which you know you see in Windows environment later on where that volume would be because it's still a volume if you don't assign a letter to it it's just a way that we would sign a letter to it so we can identify what that is so on a virtual level we're just saying that this is the really the capacity for that section of the disk by creating that that volume so what this will do is that it allows you to boot and it would can also contain operating system information. So VBR really works with MBR and boot sector to, to allow you to boot the operating system. Even though sometimes it would appear as, as you know, unpartitioned, where it's not part of any section. So if you're looking at like removable media, like USB drives and such, or floppy disk, it shows up like that, okay? But it's still part of the, 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 um, the boot process. Okay, so you might have also extended partitions. And the way that we can extend it so we can lengthen a, a section of the disk to use additional space. Because originally we only can make four section of the disk using MBR, okay? So that allows you to create a logical section of the disk, which treats it like it's a separate entity, but it's still part of the group. So your extended, you can have an extended boot record, which is your EDR, which points back to the first logical boot partition. Okay. So let's answer the VBR real quick before we get to the EDR. So the purpose of the volume boot record really is to use it to boot the operating system and it is located in sector zero. Okay, all this acronym and terminology, right? Because it's tech, it's, it is the IT world. And then the purpose of the extended boot record, your EBR, is its job is to point back to the extended logical partition because we intend to use the extended partition as additional space but if we have extended boot record, it's just going to point back to where the, the main partition that would contain the boot record. So it points to the first extended logical partition. Okay, because boot can also be contained there as well. So we needed extra space. <clears throat> Okay, oops, sorry, too fast. Okay, so with the, with the extended logical partition, what that does is that it has a pointer to the next partition, okay? So it's a way that we can see what is the next section that is logically used to extend the, 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 previous partition. So what that does is that, so you can point it to the next and the next and the next and the next after that, okay? But in MBR, you only can have four total. So I can have three extended and one primary, 
or I can have three primary and one extended. So, you know, a lot of the times you would see it like this because people run out of the option. They would have three primary section of that disk and they would have one extended disk. Okay. But with that extended disk, we need to have the extended boot record to point to the next extended uh, logical partition. And it keeps pointing to the next one and the next one after that. You have more than more than one extended. Okay, any question regarding extended partition on hard drive? Well, part of A plus, you have to know this, right? But in forensic certification, you also have to work with hard drives. So you have to know a lot of the technical information about partitioning in different OSs. Windows are a little tricky because they have they use multiple types for the modern and the legacy. So after we touch on MBR, any question on MBR? Okay, let's get into GPT. So in the later version of the OS, we use GPT partition, which use GUID, Global Unique Identifier. That means that we can use larger hexadecimal value, right, 128-bit versus if you're looking at MBR, it uses the lower hexadecimal value to identify different part space in in that partition so it would be something like this right so you would see a larger group of hex numbers and hex could be letters or numbers right number going from zero through nine and letters from a through f So here it shows you different versions of the GUID for different purposes. So date, time, and MAC address is version one. BCE security is version two. And this is regulated with the RFC, that, uh, that RFC. And then MD5 hash and namespace is with version three. And then version four is for random. And then when you use SHA-1 hash, that's version five. So the versions really represent the functionality of that, of, of, of the values that you see there. Okay. Okay, so with GPT partitioning, it's a little different than MBR in the, you know, besides the fact that we can have more partitions. So you don't have, um, so it would look something like this compared to the MBR that we saw earlier. Okay. So now to get, to be more comfortable with this, what you should do is you should maybe practice looking at a disk image. It could be your system, right? Like if you have a window system, take an image of that system and then use a tool to evaluate it. And in, in, in the image, you hopefully you'll be able to identify which one is a boot partition, which one is not. Okay, and I know that practice lab give you some practice there, but it might not be enough. So you might have to create your own virtual machine and, or, you know, if you have a computer that's extra, you can use it for forensic practices. That will probably be ideal. Okay, so you can get better at, at using the tools and seeing what it looks like. Okay, so here it shows you like the signature, what it would look like. This is the screenshot that, that the author took from his tool. And then, sorry, this one dropped down to the next page. I should shrink it a little bit more. 
So here's the GPT header, right? This table actually tells you what it is, what's the size, um, you know, what it would look like. Okay. So with the offset, if, if you're looking at like two separate sector, okay, you're going to see the entry at 128 bytes for each. And what that will do is here's another screenshot for the U. So here's the GUID partition for GPT. Okay. The first part, when you see zero, zero, that's gonna be the 16 bytes, that's gonna tell you the partition type. The next piece is the next 16 byte, it's gonna tell you whether that partition is unique. So that will be the identifier for that partition, okay? And then following will be your LBA and your attribute flags. So your partition name comes last, which is 72 bytes, okay? So now when we're using, let's go back. When you're using the software to take a look at this, right? This is what it looks like and we have to be able to take this and interpret it, what that is. Okay. On the right hand side, you do see some text information. So Right here, we see it tells you that this is a system uh, partition, but your the software tool, it, it identifies this section as a data partition. So that means that we can, they use that to be able to save data. This one is the system partition, meaning that it's using for, could be pointing to certain other partitions. Oh, no, this is the reserve one, and this is the system partition for booting, okay? And then this is also data. Okay. Any question? Okay. So now using X-Ways, which is a different tool, this is a screenshot from X-Ways. So when you go through using X-Way, HPA is used to look at the hidden area of the drives because they're part of the drive that's not, that's gonna contain some data, but it's not gonna be visible to, to your um, this management or any other tool. The user cannot see this, okay? So what we can do is we can use our forensic tool to see if there's additional section or part of that, of sections of the drive, so that way we can find some data, okay? So HPA is used to, to store recovery and diagnostic tool that cannot be changed or accessed by the user. And this is a section in the drive that's used by the company. And they use low level formatting for this, okay? And then if you're using FTK, it looks slightly different, okay? So earlier when we see, when it shows here, system partition in here, that's it right here, right? It says that this is, the, it could be that this is the drive size, right? How it should be uh, used with sector. Okay. And then for the reserve section, the reserve partitions that point back to your MBR, your GPT, et cetera. Okay, but the DCO is um, 
it allows the partition to be more uniform. So here they give you an example, 500 gig, gigabyte hard drive, right? It would use the same set of parts on 500 gig compared to 600 gig or 700 gig and so forth. Just a standard way that we, they would use the parts across different capacity of the drive. Okay, but we need to evaluate that because remember that this field is about consistency and making sure that our result is consistent throughout. So when you are evaluating different drive sizes or drive capacity, are those drives the same component? So you need to evaluate the DCO as part of that drive. So for to answer the next two questions for thir for 13 is it asks you what is the purpose of GUID and GPT it uses 128 bit hexadecimal value to identify different aspect of the computer system uniquely and then we just touch on HPA and DCO so these are the two hidden areas about the drive that we can further explore. Number one, HPA is manufacture information about recovery and tools. And then DCO is the overlay for the parts for that drive that would be standardized. Any question? Okay, we just have a few more to go, so hang tight. This is a little bit longer of a chapter. Um, it's last week there was a lot of screenshot from different tools, but this week is more of the more of the capture screen to show the output of files, how the files are written, how things are stored on the hard drive. Okay. So no question on GUID and GPT, HBA or DCO. Okay. So next we're gonna cover file system. As you know, operating system different operating system uses different file system and its functionality is that file system is used to track files and space within the partition boundaries so when you format right like windows 7 with fat32 for example that's a different file system compared to if you format it with ntfs Okay, and we'll talk about file allocation table compared to new technology file system. So again, file system is a tracking system to locate where every file is and how much space is available within the partition boundaries. Okay, so you can find some additional notes on file system on page 13. This is, you know, usually longer than what we normally see our note sets is. Okay. Now there are benefits and restriction with every file system. If you're looking at Windows environment, right, there are benefits using NTFS and then there are benefits using FAT or FAT32 or EXFAT. So legacy, Microsoft created fat allocation table. And that's fat. 
So they started with, they didn't name eight here in the text, but they started with eight and it moved to 12. So the first uh, version that was released with FAT was 12, 12 bits. And very small as far as the number of clusters that would be for the storage disk because storage disk back then was very small. Okay. And that was implemented also for floppy, the five inch floppy, which is the bigger flimsy one. Many of you were not even born back then. It was also, you know, pre my era as well. So, and then the smaller 3.5 inch floppy later on came and that was implemented with some of the later file system. So FAT16 is 16 bit, 1984, that was when it first came out for a larger drive, of course. And then we got VFAT for window, Windows 95 using virtual file allocation table. And by the time of Windows 95, people were able to use long file name. Imagine that. Long meaning 255 characters because before that, people could not name their file long due to storage limitation. Okay. So after VFAT, we have FAT32, which is 32 bit FAT allocation table. This allows you to have up to two terabyte, approximately a little bit over two terabyte as far as storage. Okay, now with the volume size, even though we can say 2.2 terabyte, you can only cut your volume up to four gigabytes. So, you know, right at the cusp of Window Vista and Windows 7, you know, era, you see that this started to transition where we move over from 32 bit to 64 bit. So with FAT32, it uses 28 bits address with the clusters. So the maximum volume size, they say that, you know, 2.2 terabyte, but Microsoft, they limit it to only 32 gig with the maximum file size of four gigabyte. Okay. So with that file system, this is what you see with the older, the older computers that didn't really need larger RAM size like or could utilize larger RAM or more RAM like what we see today. Now you can have 16 gig, 32 gig of RAM and it would be able to capitalize on all those. But if like, let's say if you're looking at like Windows XP 32 bit, right, using FAT32, you're limited because it was limited because the the technology for the hardware back then so they have to accommodate the hardware by producing the operating system that will work with the existing hardware at that time the book didn't mention exfat but exfat as we know you if you ever took 25 or study for a plus that 64 bit fat volume size would be larger than 32 gig which is what we mainly use on flash drive and external hard drive. They format it with FAT or EXFAT so that way it work across multiple platform including Mac OS. Okay. So as far as file allocation table, it's a way that we would be able to track where the files are. So think of it like a map where it would map where each file would be and how much space that's available for additional files or the space that's used by the existing file. So what that does is it breaks it up into two parts, system area and data area, okay? So if you're looking at the root directory, which really is you know, if we're looking from a Windows standpoint, that's your C volume, your C drive, right? So inside it, you would have your system files. And if you, you know, from a user standpoint, when you go and you look into the folder, your system 32, you start diving into looking at different 
files area. So the root directory and the files belong to the data area. The boot record and the actual file allocation table itself belongs to the system area. Okay, as it laid out there. Okay. Okay, so let's explain um, how fat, so when you add a file, what does, ha what happens when you add a file, right? So here it shows you how the VBR would work with the sector. Um, let me see. Now each of these um, numerical value is essential because it, it, it tells you what it is. So when you look at that screen capture, right? What is a zero zero mean with the hex? So there's a list for that. Okay. If you want to look at the number of sectors, so you would have hex 20 or hex 24 for the logical sector. And then the fat version is indicated at X at 2A. So that provides you with a list on how to identify what each of the, and what piece of information that you can get from that screen capture from the software tool that they have. Okay, so if it's unallocated, we know it shows up as 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 for that cluster. Okay, so when you see that if it's a bad cluster, you would have Fs and then a value like seven. Usually that would be the smallest cluster. <coughs> if, if it's used by a file for that cluster, it would have S and then eight. So seven is the back cluster and then eight is for the allocated, which is used by the file. Okay. So what does that mean? So a cluster can be made up of many or a few sectors. It could be, de it depends. How, you know, if you're looking at the older disk, the sector size is smaller, so you can have many sectors. On the newer disk, the sector size is larger, so you might have a few sectors to represent the cluster. So the picture kind of shows you how, so cluster is a group of sectors. So when you add a file, it depends on the file size. What that does is it can, it will spread out to multiple sectors. So your cluster size is important because on the older disk, right, your cluster size would be smaller compared to the modern disk where you would have larger group of sectors where it would be 512 added up to be that cluster size. So what it will do is it spread across different sector and then it will update the file allocation table on where that is so it can map that file. So let's say I say file1.txt and my file1.txt is one megabyte and what that does is it's going to spread it across let's say that if I have 512 bytes per sector it just divides that out it spread it across different sector it's gonna tie back to the cluster, which groups up the sector, and it updates the file allocation table, which keep tracks of which cluster and which sector where my file1.txt is. It doesn't necessarily be sequential, so you don't have like sector one, two, three, four, five. It will jump across because as you know, data will spread across dynamically storing onto the disk. So therefore we have fragmentation in file. Now when, when the system defragment, so when we run defragmentation tool to restructure that, what that does is that it moves it to different sector, 
which ties back to the cluster and it updates the file allocation table to the new updated sector information and cluster information. Okay, question. So you're expected to know this for quiz and test. Okay. So for 16, when the user add files to the data area, the system will update the file allocation table as it would, it may be in one or more sector, depends on the file size. And also clusters are not sequential. So you can have file that are fragmented, so it needs to update and be able to map out where that file is. And you can find all of this in textbook and notes as well. You can summarize it if you wish, but that is what, is what happened when you add a, a file. Now, file name plays an important role. There are short file names and long file name in the legacy system. If you're looking at like pre Windows 95, like Windows 3.x, right? Back then, they could only use short file names. But even on our modern operating system, what happens is even when you use a long file name, what that does is it, in the back, it shortens it. So that way it can track your file quickly. Okay, so with the short file names back then we could only use eight characters, eight characters are allowed. Okay, anything less than eight. So it takes the character and it would pads it with hex 20 or 20. That's only for the portion of the file name. So when I name file1.txt, right, that's under the eight characters. So each of the, the character, F, I, L, E, it will take that and then it would get padded with hex20. Then the file extension in Windows environment, we use the three character for the file extension like .exe, .txt. That's also get padded with the hex 20 value. So what that does is it calculates the value and it would be able to map the values to the location of that file. Um, Professor, I have a quick question. Um, yes, Devin. I was um, using uh, like NetBeans. And, um, oh my gosh, I can't remember it now. But anyways, I was, I was I was saving it using a Linux. I was saving files using a Linux program. But then mm -hmm. when I went back into my Windows like file manager, um, they were like they had been allocated with like user and then my username and then to a certain hard drive before it like saved, but it didn't show up when I was using the Linux program for that. So is well, then I found in the variables how I could change and adjust my file names when I save them. So if I check out that user, like the user part portion and then the actual like user name, will that change my file allocation system or will it just go straight down to that hard drive? So uh, yeah, Windows is going to try to bury it into the directory as it's, it's trying to map you, right? Like on, because you have to log in as a user and that user log into that system and then that system is, you know, so it's varying under the directory, right? Yeah. Now you're saying if you remove the directory, now only because Linux technically would see fat allocation table. So when you're looking at the, the, you know, let's say it's on the flash drive and if you save it as, let's say like a .java file, for example, right? Or .text, right? What that will do is, yeah, you should be able to find it if you just drop it into a directory that it can identify. But now, only if it's, it's formatted as a specific file system, because if you use NTFS, 
Linux is not going to be able to see that. It will see it as a storage and you won't be able to, to really dig into it. So it, it's important on what file system you use to write that file. So should I make a should I make an additional directory so that way the Linux can route to that one because everything I'm yeah. using now it's going so, to my C hard drive and I'm like that's so, not no so what you should do is you should make a partition if you have unallocated space on your drive let's say that you have 500 gig hard drive right and your C your Windows partition your your primary is only at 200 gig and so you have 300 gig left so what you do is you you use that 300 of unallocated space and you can create a partition and you can format it just for data use only it's not bootable wow you just made all the classes i've taken for cis kind of work <laughs> well at one point we want to draw all the pictures together right Hopefully, yeah. at, you know, at either in this class or another class, because ultimately in the computing world is like all of these classes are going to pull all the other knowledge together and it's going to say, hey, this is what it's all about either. And, and you see that with computer science or cybersecurity or whatever, but I'm going to show you real quick on what that would look like. And you can do it straight from Windows environment or you can just do it doing installation or whatever. Right? Oh, I just but, did it. I just did it in my um, cybersecurity lab like a couple weeks ago. We were like yeah. allocating partitions and yeah. then uh, we were doing uh, like RAID 5s and all the backups and then, uh, you know, doing mm -hmm. the. Yeah. So on Practice Lab or NetLab Plus, you, they have a lab for that, but you can use your disk management console in, in Windows environment or, you know, if you're using Linux, they do have a tool like that depending on your release. And then what you can do is you can section the unallocated space and then format it. Now, every file system is specific to the OS, except for the fact that FAT is, you know, or VFAT, a lot of the times now they use VFAT for flash drive and storage to really be able to, to, to use in Mac OS, Linux, and Windows environment. So if you create a space where it would be usable for other OS, then it would see it would be seen by other OS and then you can put it into, you can save your file there and it will be there. I just have to make sure that's a FAT32, not the NTFS, correct? Right, because if you use NTFS, only be seen by Windows. Mm -hmm. Got it, got it. Thank you, awesome. Yeah. You're welcome. I know that they have a tool that you can convert it you know, a lot of the cross platform software, you know, file conversion software, basically it just converts so that way it could be seen, um, you know, so file system, other file system can see that file, right? And then some files are compatible with others, but as you write it in different file system, that makes a significance, so. Okay, makes sense. Okay, all right, good. <laughs> Okay, so we, we understand that short file names, eight characters or less, it gets padded, the file extension gets padded, and then if you using, you know, you can't use any symbol or space, and this is on the older, like if you're looking at older windows, older system. And then with the long file name, of course we can use up to 255 characters, but the way that, so let's say that I use 80 characters for my file name. What that will do is it's gonna take the first few characters and it's gonna make it an alias. So it formats the alias with the first three characters after the file extension. And then the first six character gets converted to the alias uppercase. And so, this is a way that it looks at at long file name is that it shortens it right using the a till character so that way it can quickly map it even though we're able to use you know you can use you know like a whole sentence for your file name if you want but the system what it does is it's only going to care about the first three character and then the first six character along with the file extension so that way it can know. So think of it like this, right? Um, 
you know how when you create your account with banking or whatever, whenever they need to verify you, they only use the last four digit of your social security number or you know a, a few digit of your driver license or whatever it is. And they would know that you are uniquely that person. And it's very much like that. So what it is, is, is using specific characters to really make it an alias or a nickname so that way it can incrementally or it would find that file where that would be. So here when it says that it would increase incrementally for additional files, so it's going to say, so let's say that I have file1.txt and file2.txt. How it's going to be able to identify that is that it's using the alias increment to really map out the next file. Um, and we're not just talking about data file, we're also talking about system file as well, right? Like for the operating system. So that's how it's really organizing and tracking your file names if you're using long or short file names. Okay, any question? Okay, we're almost done. So I know it's a lot of details and just answering questions. So it's not that exciting, right? But all of this is very useful in IT and, and security or, or forensic, most importantly. Okay. So we already saw the illustration. Sorry, have, yes, go ahead. I have, I have a question. So if I'm, if I'm down, I'm deleting files off of my computer and don't defrag them will it leave partial files like floating around yes so so it's not fully delete what that does is it's releasing that space back so it's make that space available for new files sometimes that space don't get overwritten so when you say file right like let's say i delete file one and i create another file called file two File two doesn't necessarily write over file one. So what that does is it just gives back that, it tells the system that that space is available. So that's why in forensic, they can still be able to find your file after you delete. And then when you delete, it also takes some of the space, it put it back into the Slack space, especially with system file. So, and we'll talk about that shortly, but, um, so, but you can still find it also with flash technology and 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 um, solid state. It also used an index mechanism depending on the the manufacturer, but it it actually index everything for um, for file storage. So, for example, you notice this when you take pictures on your smartphone and you delete that picture and you take the next picture, right? It the way that the operating system does is that it automatically says that, oh, this is image one, delete image one. The next one is not going to be image one, it's image two. Okay. Because it's but, indexed. Yeah, but physically it doesn't write over index one. It it's, could be there or it could be somewhere else. So, so the computer just moves on to the next allocated space. Right. What's available, it's going to do it quick. So in the data area, you know, for, for the data area, it could spread across. So this is what it would look like, right? So your question earlier, when I put it into recycle bin, it's here, right? That, in this yellow section right here, it says recycle bin, it's there. So all that does is that, that, that space is usable for other things, but you could still retrieve it from recycle bin, correct? If you click retrieve back and put it back from trash or whatever, it's still gonna put it back so that file is still there. Now, if you permanently delete it, what that does is it's, there's, you know, there's still some part of that file that's there, but what it does is it takes that space. So why are they able to retrieve pieces of that file is that, because remember that your, your, um, your sector is the smallest unit and then you have the cluster what if it uses up some sector, but not the other? So some resonance of that file after you delete is still there. 
So that's why they're able to retrieve, especially like with image or sound or noise, they're still able to retrieve pieces of that file from those sectors in the cluster. So you're just saying like that file is still split up into different bits. And then if you don't delete, or well, the whole bit, well, the whole file can't be deleted because it's allocated to different bits throughout the memory, right? Right, to different parts, different space. Right, and it depends on the size. Of, mm -hmm. And ultimately, right, ultimately, if we zero out everything, like what they said in the last unit, right, they said that before you go and gather evidence, your disk have to be sanitized because <clears throat> even if you delete files from your last case, it might still be there and that might impact the next case. So if you zero it out, if you write it, you stripe it with you know a character like zero then it is sanitized so it's the same way for storage disk if if you delete things it doesn't necessarily become delete in operating system okay okay and then the example on this screen the one at the bottom has been striped okay. with zero yeah so if you permanently delete right if yeah so you use a sanitized software tool that would allow you to sanitize, for example, like you told me earlier, you want to make a partition to put your file for your classes. And then when you're done with the partition, so in a secure environment, we would say, oh, we wanted to delete everything from there. And then we also wanted to, 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 to write zero to it. So that way, you know, when somebody else trying to access that drive, if it's accidentally shared somehow, they won't be able to see anything that we did previously. Okay. Same thing with SD and flash drive and everything else. Okay. So keep in mind that before, you know, that's why people physically destroy things if they can't, they burn it or, you know, whatever, if they can't zero it out. Got it. Okay. Now, uh, for it to be zeroed out, you need a special tool or would a factory uh, hard reset do that for you? You, you can, you can use a specific tool. They said mm -hmm. that even on the factory, uh, when you do factory reset, so let's say I factory reset my laptop right now. My data mm -hmm. is still there. Because, so when you, even in some format, remember when you format is when you write system file to a certain location. Let's say that I have 500 gig disk, but then the second time around, I revert it back, it's smaller or or even when it, it's the same, it's not occupying all that space because I originally had a bunch of data there, right? So when I factory reset, that space is still there. It doesn't necessarily, the files don't go away until you sanitize it. Okay, so, I have a quick... Yeah. Sorry, I have a quick question because I, I work for Heroku Unified and I work on the Chromebooks and if we can't... Um, if there's a problem with the Chromebook, we just power wash it and then render a new image on there. It, does that get rid of all the hard drive too or no? no? So, so rendering the image is writing operating system, writing files to the section of that disk again. It's, it's kind of like reverting it back to manufacture or when you write an image to it, you just, oh, you write it over the existing storage. So is that just more of like a firmware, like just getting the operating system back right? Yes, yes. But it doesn't necessarily got rid of all the, the stuff that the kids saved on there previously. So even on the malware level, like they say that, you know, even if you, you know how you pe people bring the computer and they have malware. And when people delete the partition and reformat the disk. So deleting the partition means what? just release that space back to unallocated space, right? It's just like, yeah. oh. And then when you create another partition, you just re-section another space. It's kind of like, think of it like a, a house. So you can reconfigure the room. It's still in that house, right? So when the malware, when it writes, sometimes it's still there because what happens is if, if you don't write over where the malware was, it's still there. It's there. They're still, it's still on that disk. So what happens is that, you know, sometimes it will resurface or it's still, it's still going to impact the files because that even it's in the allocated, unallocated space on the Slack space. Now, is that more like a rootkit or is that more malware? Mm -hmm. Rootkit. It's still a malware, but <laughs> Got it, yeah, malware. Yeah. 
but all right um so we talked about long file name you can find that in the notes and then now how do you recover the deleted files for evidence first you need to find the cluster of that file okay the size of the file table and the size of the cluster volume and some of this will go back to your boot okay so the the and if you're not using specialized software so you will have to go back to your boot sector information to really find what is your cluster size and and so that way you can map it to that file once you determine where find the first cluster of that file then you would find you would determine the file size and and when you're using the, the software tool, the forensic software tool that, that is shown in the text, they said that would, the file size information is in the last four bytes, okay? So when you evaluate that, you say, okay, that's the last four bytes, which represent the file size. So my file could be gigs, could be megs, could be bytes, right? So here it talks a, a bunch of stuff about hidden flags, long file names, and then here's the deleted files. This is on page 17 of your note. This is for fat allocation table only though. The NTFS stuff is a little different down the line. Okay, so it shows the steps here and it gives you the illustration here, okay, on what it would look like. So once you have the first cluster, then the file size and determine the file size, you would look at the last four bits and here it shows that here, 270000. Now remember that this is hexadecimal, so you can use your programmer calculator to convert it to decimal which give you the byte size. So what they're saying here is this number converted to decimal is 39 bytes, which is the size of that file that they were looking at. Okay, so when you look at this value, you have to convert it to decimal. And then, you know, so the stuff that, if you took my discrete structure class or my assembly class, you probably learned that, but you can use your programmer calculator. So open your calculator in Windows, click programmer mode, punch in 27, two seven in hex with that equivalent to decimal, you should click decimal, it shows you, okay? So when you delete file, that changes the entry in the file allocation table, okay? So if it's a larger file, it actually, you know, changed, it updates the cluster and the file size information. So keep in mind, that it does that. So here's my answer to make it quick because we're coming to the end now. So to we find the, the, the cluster information, the size of the file. Then we also, from the size of the file, then we can determine the sector size. And then we can obtain the sector, sector information from the boot record. Now, using the software tool like X-Ways and things like that, you have to know where to look. So file size is the last four bit, like what they show you. And then the other values will indicate, right, how that would map out to the file. I like the text in that it gives you a lot of the example on how to look at the use different software. I think they chose Paladin and X-Way and sometime FTK, but um, so we see some illustration there, like which character to look for, what hex values to look for. And, and also you can, in some tool, you can actually change the value, the hex value, and that, that updates the file allocation table and it allows you to access like what he says here. You can change the character to like dash or underscore. So you can get information about the file name. Okay. 
So when, after it gets delete, what it will do is it's gonna put it into the, the Slack space. So it says almost no files will conveniently fit into the cluster boundary. So anything excess of that cluster, it takes that little bit and it puts it into the Slack space. It's called file Slack. Now, until it's overwritten, it's still going to remain there. So if it's not, if nothing writes over, it's still going to be there. So things like document files, digital image like photo, chat history, uh, emails, and a lot of the communication data will be found in the Slack space. Okay. Any question? Okay, so for the lab this week, we will work on, you know, recovering some of the data from the windows using different tools. So you have a little bit more experience with using different tools there. Okay, so for the Slack space, it contained data from the previous file that was, or it could previously deleted, I should say. Until it is overwritten, the data will remain for you to be to find. So that's the area that you need to look at as well. Why is the Slack space often containing the type of files that we mentioned, like image and chat? They are larger files. So as you know, that it would fit, it doesn't fit the boundary of the cluster, it's gonna throw it over there. So all the excess is going to go into the Slack space and that's how you're going to be able to find it. Any question? Okay. Now NTFS is a little bit different. Um, I recommend that you, if you have the textbook, go through the textbook and look at how they evaluate NTFS because the way that it maps out the file is different than file allocation table, of course. I did include the notes for the NTFS in the last portion, okay? And also the way they identify files is slightly different than file allocation table, the attribute. So you still have file attributes, file name, extension, the root, and, and some of the indexing, but um, it's a little bit different. A lot of the screen capture toward the end so it doesn't have a lot of reading, so you can take a look at it so you can see. Okay. Any questions? So we did 20 questions in Q&A right now. Um, if you finish, you can submit it. If not, you have until Wednesday to turn it in. Okay. If you have any outstanding